The Métis are a distinct indigenous people. Métis communities in Ontario emerged along waterways and fur trade routes before Canada was a country. These historic Métis communities, which persist to the present day, develop their own customs, traditions, and identities that are rooted in kinship, relationship to the land, and a distinctive culture and way of life. Looking back now, that connection with the water, when I think about what makes me Métis, part of it is that connection with the water. As far back as 1679, French traders were establishing fur trade posts in the Pays Ao, north of Lake Superior. As the fur trade continued to expand west of the Great Lakes, the importance of this region to the fur trade increased. Canoe brigades were not able to travel from Montreal to west of the Great Lakes and back in a single ice-free season. As a result, Northern Lake Superior became a key midway transshipment point in the fur trade. This location became the meeting place of canoes from Montreal that were transporting new trade goods and canoes from the interior that were transporting furs from the previous season. In 1803, after an international boundary line was drawn north of Grand Portage and the United States threatened to begin levying customs duties, the Northwest Company moved their depot and rendezvous site from Grand Portage north to Fort William. The fort was quiet during the winter, but in the spring, hundreds of fur traders joined the existing fort community. Furs arriving from the west were sorted, cleaned, and repacked. Trade goods were distributed. Food provisions were prepared. Business councils were held. Repairs were made to canoes and equipment. Evening festivities and banquets were held that featured fiddles and dancing. Old Fort William, it was a main trading post because of its location. Um, and like anybody that had any to do with fur trading or any other a commodity that's going across country, it would, it's, a, it's a darn good place to, to meet and, and trade and uh, transfer uh, goods, whatever. This annual gathering became a site of social interaction between three distinct cultural groups. First Nations, traders from Montreal, and traders who lived year-round in the interior. Traders who chose to stay in the interior were often Métis or Métis forebearers. These men stayed in the interior because of their kinship and cultural connections in the region. Métis and First Nations who are living together in one community, they still had their own um, ways of doing things that were slightly different than the First Nations community. And of course, it's largely that First Nations influence that um, has us where we are today uh, as Métis, but it's also that European ancestry too. So it is that blend. It was a distinct culture even then. The Métis populations in both Lakehead and Nipigon engaged in fishing, making maple sugar, trapping small game, and hunting as a part of provisioning the posts. At Fort William, some of these Métis families were noted as gardeners. Fishing in particular was crucial to post provisioning by Métis. Métis employees tended to occupy similar positions within the post establishment, which were distinctive from the roles of both the company gentry and the local First Nation population. Those positions included blacksmith, tinsmith, cooper, boat and canoe builder, and occasionally apprentice postmaster. Women and children, with or without their men, collected the materials for canoes, weeded and harvested the gardens, snared rabbits, and made maple sugar. Métis women made moccasins, netted snowshoes, fashioned clothing including mittens, caps and leggings, were renowned for their beautiful bead and quill work, and were of great assistance in running the fur trade posts and forts. A Métis community quickly grew around Fort William. This community was distinct from the First Nations and Europeans in the area. One Crown official noted that Half-breeds in this area lived in houses instead of wigwams or huts like the Indians. 
pursued a somewhat different lifestyle, had mainly French-Canadian origins, were practicing Catholics, and maintained distinctive surnames. Northwest Company trader Gabriel Franchaire describes the existence of this community at Fort William in 1814. There are also, on the opposite bank of the river, a certain number of log houses, all inhabited by old Canadian voyageurs, worn out in the service of the company without having enriched themselves, married to women of the country, and encumbered with large families of half-breed children. These men prefer to cultivate a little Indian corn and potatoes, and to fish for subsistence rather than to return to their native districts. The requirements and characteristics of the fur trade, including interaction of First Nations and European people, the necessity of certain skills, such as canoe building, the need for mobility between post locations, and long-distance canoe travel, resulted in the development of a fur trade culture. Over time, these features became somewhat synonymous with Métis culture. Various religious and cultural traditions were also observed. They did the height of land ceremonies for newcomers, said prayers at dangerous sites, and they pulled off hats and made the sign of the cross when leaving one stream for another. Métis voyagers paddled 16 to 18 hours per day. On portages, they carried at least two 90-pound packs, often using a leather sling or sash as a tump line across their heads. They were known for their joie de vivre because of their tradition of music and dance. They sang songs to set the beat of the paddle while traveling in a canoe. They sang in their homes and communities when they worked or gathered. They danced into the wee hours of the morning. Métis took pride in their appearance. They stopped to shave, wash, and put on clean clothes before arriving at a post. To go along with their colorful personalities, they had colorful sashes, blanket coats, red milled caps, and colorful beadwork on their clothing. Hudson Bay records speak about the superior abilities of Métis employees from this community. They also indicate that men from this community were beginning to push for improved wages. Chief Factor J. Thomas, 1803. The greatest trouble I have experienced this year is from half-breed or Creoles who complain their wages are much less than others. And as they are all boat steerers, they think they have a right to better wages than they have. Mr. Sanders, on, has three stout sons who all steer boats. Besides, there is... Hugh Linkletter, son of John Linkletter, and John Kipling Jr., all stout men. They act as interpreters and are, in every respect, most useful people, for they hunt equally as well as the natives, and it is by their endeavors, frequently in hunting, the several posts fare much better than they otherwise would do without them. Life changed dramatically for the Métis of Northern Lake Superior during the second half of the 19th century, after the Métis were excluded from the Robinson Treaties in 1850. The treaty delegation, headed by William Benjamin Robinson, told the Métis that their mandate was to negotiate with First Nations chiefs and not the Métis. However, the Northern Lake Superior Métis community continued to press the Canadian government to respect Métis rights. In the 1880s, multiple petitions were submitted by the First Nation and Métis from various parts of the North Shore. The fur trade declined, and in 1883, the post at Fort William was closed. Half-breed populations continued to be documented around Thunder Bay, Red Rock, and Lake Nipigon during this period. The contemporary Métis community continues to practice traditional ways of life including harvesting, guiding, and stewardship over the land. I knew that my family grew up um, doing things that people in this day and age were happy not to be doing, like hunting and gathering our own food and, um, you know, camping and going up 
like north north to north camps and spending weeks out there and um, so I always knew that we sort of approach things differently um, but I, I didn't know that that was Métis. There's unlimited harvesting here, uh, anywhere from mushrooms to blueberries, raspberries, uh, choke cherries, pin cherries, wild mint for tea. <laughs> there's unlimited. I mean, there's no reason to starve here. I mean, uh, there's food here all summer, you know. You got the, uh, the moose and deer and fish and partridge and rabbits. There's unlimited food. It's all organic, right? It's, it's from the land, mm. so it's organic. You're not going to get much more organic than that. Being a Métis, uh, you have to accumulate like pride through knowledge type thing. I'm very proud to be Métis and I'm proud that my five-year-old already knows he's Métis.